an intentional push to focus on like the degeneracy on the yes. laptop uh, and not cover the the corruption that seems to be to be living on this device and yes. that's why I'm happy you're here today and we can begin diving into yes. these violations and the the scope of the corruption and the depth of it like like mm -hmm. how bad is it well, the beautiful thing is that we don't have to uh, take it from second and third hand sources. So, for instance, if we just had Tony Bobolinsky coming forward about this deal, the report that we would have been able to write would be maybe like 150 pages. But the fact is, is that unlike FOIA requests or other leaks, we have all of the all of the material firsthand. It's primary, primary yeah, sources. Imagine if somebody actually had your laptop; they could do a complete or my laptop, they could do a complete digital colonoscopy, as we call it. Um, that's what we've done. So basically, uh, our group, I use a leftist term. I, I want to call it overtly leftist, but a leftist-sounding term to describe us. We're basically an OSINT collective. So what we did for over a year is basically we looked at the laptop contacts, there are about 4,500 of them. We found we somebody wrote a script based on the contents of the emails to see who Hunter was corresponding with the most. So we took the top 25 people that he emailed with the most and ran background checks on every single one of them. We see which LLCs they're invested in. And then we basically make a link analysis chart of how Hunter knows them and and see which deals they're talking about on the laptop. Because we have an, this laptop is incredible in that we get to see their correspondence real time. So unlike, you know, other groups that maybe have to sue to get agency communications through the FOIA and then the damn agencies redact half of it, we get to see exactly how Hunter responded in the moment. And in, it's not just Hunter. In these emails, you have uh, verifiable proof that Hunter and Joe shared bank accounts along with Hunter's business partner. And both of those people had authority to write checks and uh, deposit money on behalf of the sitting vice president of the United States. Um, we have just going going through my mind's eye of, of the report, uh, SEC fraud. They backdated documents con, uh, involving their broker-dealer. They uh, did other things involving uh, involving money laundering. And, of course, all of these, all of these scenarios, Marty, are not – they're not dealing with other Americans most of the time. They're dealing with foreign nationals, which brings another level of this to it. If it, if it were just domestic lobbying uh, scenarios, it would be sort of scummy and very K Street and very corrupt. But I don't think the impact would be as, as high. It's the fact that they're dealing with uh, Kazakhstani oligarchs, uh, Chinese oligarchs, Romanian oligarchs. It's truly global in its scale. So we're not saying that the Bidens started being corrupt when Joey became the vice president. I think they've always been corrupt, but the scale of it became much greater because there are opportunities for Hunter to be a consultant to these countries or to be a, a consultant to oligarchs from these countries increased when his dad became the VP. Yeah. So it seems like Hunter is simply a conduit for these other foreign actors, yes. state actors, to get <clears throat> influence in the U.S. or uh, at the very least via the president. So what, what are the intentions of China, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, or everybody on this list? Yeah, the – well, not speculating, just going off – purely the email correspondence, usually they hire him for a specific purpose. So in the in the example of Ukraine and Romania, they're very similar. You have a, a foreign oligarch. In the case of Ukraine, it was Mikola Zolchevsky. In the case of Romania, it was Gabriel Popovicu. And both of them were being pursued by law enforcement within their own country. And what they hired Hunter for, and we have, we have the wire transfers for some of these and the email correspondence. What they wanted Hunter to do was use his influence and connections in the U.S. government, specifically the U.S. embassies abroad in uh, Kiev and Bucharest, respectively, to basically strong arm and or nudge those officials within their own countries not to go after these figures. So what did this amount to? In Ukraine, it... It amounted to Joe uh, threatening to withhold a loan guarantee of $1 billion 
that was going to come through the IMF, if Petro Poroshenko, the then president of Ukraine, would not fire Viktor Shokin. And this was, this, there's a clip of this. There's a- and I said, I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid at the time. An amazing clip of this that occurred in January of 2018 with Joey, Richard Haas, and Michael Carpenter, who's our current ambassador to the OSCE um, in, at the Council of Foreign Relations, that organization that I'm sure – you know, you loathe this just as much as I do. Uh, the CFR is behind, I think, a lot of the things going wrong in, in the world. But he, he basically brags about it. He's like, you know, uh, if I'm leaving here in six hours, if the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Yeah. And he brags about, it. well, son of a bitch, she got fired. And, and well, just based off that clip, people were only able to speculate that there was some influence peddling going on. But via the laptop and the documents you found, you're actually... Like that's that cold hard proof. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. It was just p- speculation before Hunter left off, you know, left his laptop. But basically, all that occurred in that phone call that Joe was recounting that occurred in December of 2015. In November of 2015, there is an email from Vadim Pizarski, who was the executive uh, advisor to Burisma's board saying that, Hunter, we would really appreciate if you could use your influence to convey a signal. And this is in broken English, by the way. That's why I'm talking like this. This is Vadim writing to Hunter. Use your influence uh, to convey a signal that these are politically motivated attacks against against McCullough and uh, to shut down these investigations. So Joe's doing this two weeks after Hunter gets an email that says, we'd like these investigations shut down. So you make a great point. If somebody is a skeptic and listening to me right now, if we're just going off Joe's public statements, it's smelly and requires further investigation. But because we have the primary source material of Hunter at the time, we can definitively show that Hunter was being asked to do this and his dad then effectuated the ask two weeks later. And if somebody is a skeptic even more, consider this. The main retort to what I just said by Dan Goldman and other people uh, in politics is that Joe was just effectuating U.S. policy more broadly, that everybody wanted the prosecutor gone because in their mind the prosecutor wasn't doing enough to, to prosecute corruption, which is ridiculous. But but anyways, we now have a document through John Solomon. He got this through FOIA. We now have a document through John Solomon that shows there was an interagency memo in November of 2015, at the exact time Hunter was receiving that email, showing that the U.S. interagency approved of the job that Victor Shokin was doing, and thus they wanted to approve the IMF loan again. River is the best place to buy Bitcoin. Go to river.com slash TFTC, sign up today, set up an account, and start stacking sats. Back to the So video. it shows that Joe reversed U.S. official U.S. policy, official U.S. interagency policy, two weeks after the interagency agreed that Shokin was doing a good job. And what? so ex, how do they explain that? They don't. They don't want to address that interagency memo. And by the way, that only came out in 2022. So during the impeachment, that was the key comeback from Jamie Raskin and all these other people, that Joe wasn't doing this for any personal gain whatsoever. He was just going along with what the EU and other American executive agencies wanted to do, which was fire Shokin. But we now know that these executive agencies didn't want to fire Shokin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's yeah, reason. It, it's it, without the memo from Solomon, if I am a skeptic, what this scenario is like 80% uh solid without Solomon's interagency memo because I can prove the emails from Vadim Pizarski and I can prove that Joe took t- did that call on December 7th with Poroshenko in 2015 but with Solomon's memo the case is shut I would love to be able to Dan Dan Goldman pisses me off so much because he he speaks with such conviction and nobody on the hill is smart enough to bring up that other memo that shows that Joe was doing exactly the opposite of what the interagency recommended. So that's Ukraine, and I know I'm going on a monologue because I get so excited. But the other one is 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 Romania, that oligarch 
is named Gabriel Popovichu. He got uh, convicted and sentenced to seven years of prison for bribery over a commercial real estate deal in downtown Bucharest called uh, uh, Banasia, B-A-N-A-S-E-A. For anybody at home, they can go look it up. And um, what happened is Hunter, Mike Gottlieb, Christopher Boys, and Louis Free, the former director of the FBI, the guy in the 90s who oversaw Ruby Ridge, Waco, the 9-11 bombings. Louis Free was in charge for all of that. He and Hunter basically lobbied the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest, and we have proof of this. The then U.S. Ambassador, Hans Klim, met with Hunter to discuss the U.S. Embassy on uh, advocating on behalf of Gabriel Popovichu, and they were getting paid 60 grand a month. They got a contract for sixty grand a month to set up these meetings from 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 the from the from the Romanian oligarch. Guess what? He got off eventually. He fled to London. There there was an inter. They, they they tried to get an Interpol warrant out. He was a fugitive in London for years, and he got a London court to call off the conviction. Romanian oligarch Gabriel Popovicu, um, and so what we have here in just in, in, in anybody who's interested in these two scenarios that I just laid out, uh, they can go look at all the emails that I'm. You know, I say a 644 page report. That's true, but only half of it is writing. It's a lot of footnotes. Yeah, and it's a lot of exhibits. It's not boring. So if you're if you're just tuning in and thinking, well, I don't want to read 650 pages. All that we're doing is showing the original exhibits and then explaining what they are right above them. And so if you just want to go read those two subsections in the business-related crimes in about Ukraine and Romania, you can do that in 90 minutes. That's like a Saturday afternoon thing. So I, I just don't, I don't want people to be dissuaded from looking into it because it's so it's so long. Uh, the Romanian one is is particularly interesting because it involves a gentleman named Mike Gottlieb, who who's a Democratic fixer. He was the attorney for Seth Rich's brother, oh. Aaron Rich, uh, when they sued uh, Fox News for for defamation. He was also Michael Gottlieb was just at the January six hearings because he represented Ruby Freeman. So Mike Gottlieb represented Hunter Biden, Seth Rich's brother, and Ruby Freeman, and he worked at Boy Schiller Flexner at the time. And uh, Mike Gottlieb is basically the guy the Democrats bring in, or I don't even say Democrats, much broader than that, like highfalutin leftists bring in when they have a real problem. So Mike Gottlieb now is, at, I think he's at Wilkie and Farr, I think. Uh, but he, he was, a, he was a, the counsel in the Obama White House. And he's, of any of the figures... In this laptop, I would say Mike Gottlieb is one of the smartest and one of the sharpest and the most cunning. We talked before 